What's going on guys? In this video we're going to learn three methods we can use to model seasonal effects. We're going to learn binary variables, which we already learned in linear regression, and then we're going to learn trigonometric functions, and then finally seasonal autoregressive models. Binary variables. So we already covered this in linear regression, but we'll cover it again quickly. So here our dates start from January 2019 and span all the way through December 2020, and they're going to have monthly intervals. So we can make a new variable for the month and then just sequence our month names through this time series. So we're going to start with January, February, March, and then so on, so on, so on until we get to December of 2020. And then we can convert these variables to binary variables. And ultimately, we can make the formula of y, is t, y of t is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 for January plus beta 2 for February, plus beta 3 for March, and then so on, so on, so on, until we get to beta 11 for November. And then December would just be our baseline variable, which would be added to the intercept. So ultimately, we're going to add 11 coefficients for our 12 possible months. Trigonometric functions. So another way to model the seasonal component of our time series analysis is with trigonometric functions. So here we're gonna have a sine curve. So if you don't remember, a sine curve ultimately forms this pattern, and it's gonna take two pi in order to complete one cycle. And this will ultimately just continue on and on and on forever. So with this formula, we're gonna to try to model now the seasonal component using the same idea. So A is gonna be our amplitude, which is gonna be the difference between our max in min value divided by 2. And then f of t is going to be equal to 2 pi over our seasonal base. And then finally, b is just going to be equal to our shift. Now let's do an example. Say we have the formula 2 times the sine of our f of t plus 0. And we want to say that our seasonal base is equal to 12. So seasonal base is just the number of intervals it, get, it takes to complete one cycle. So for instance, if you're doing monthly data in a year to get from January back to January, it would take 12 intervals, so your seasonal base would be 12. If you're doing quarterly data, such as quarter one, quarter two to quarter four, it would take four quarters to get from quarter one back to quarter one. So your seasonal base would be equal to four. So here we're gonna have seasonal base 12. So our formula is gonna become two times the sine of two pi over 12 times t plus zero. So our two is the amplitude. So our sine curve is gonna start at zero and it's gonna have an amplitude of two. So this means the highest value is gonna be two and the lowest value is going to be negative 2. Because if we take the difference of the 2 and divide by 2, so 2 minus negative 2 over 2, it should equal to our amplitude, which is equal to 2. And now 2 pi over 12. So regularly, it takes 2 pi to complete one cycle. Now it's 2 pi over 12, so it's going to take 12 intervals to complete one cycle. Which makes sense because if we're working with monthly data per se, it would take 12 intervals to get back to January if we start at January. So then three quarters of the way would be nine, halfway would be six, and then one quarter of the way would be three. And this would just repeat perpetually. Now, if instead we were to change our equation to two sine times f of t plus three. So here we're going to have a shift in our data. And we're still using seasonal base 12. So our formula is going to become 2 times the sine of 2 pi over 12 times t plus 3. So what the shift does is it's just going to shift our curve to the right by 3 units. So here is our original curve, but now it's just going to be everything shifted to the right by 3. So we can see. At time 12, it was 0. So now we can say 
at time 15 is going to be 0. And then at time 9, it was negative 2. So now at time 12, it's going to be negative 2. And then at time 6, it was 0. So now at time 9, it's going to be 0. And then at time 0, or time 3, it was 2. So now at time 6, it's going to be 2. And then at time 0, it was 0. So now at time 3, it's going to be 0. And then if we extend this, so this would mean now at time 0, it's going to be negative 2. And then if we just connect our dots, this will be our new sine curve. So now I'm going to do a derivation of the second function you need to know for trigonometric functions. So feel free to just zone me out for about the next 30 seconds. So we're going to have the a sine of our f of t plus b. Well, through an identity, the sine of x plus y is equal to the sine of x cosine y plus the sine of y cosine x. So we can form the function of beta 1 times the sine of f of t plus beta 2 times the cosine of f of t, where beta 1 is going to be equal to a times the cosine of b, and beta 2 is going to be equal to a times the sine of b. And then we can plug this function into our original time series uh, function that we've been using, where y is t is equal to beta 0 plus our, our seasonal component plus epsilon t. And then we can add more than one of these, so essentially it's going to become a summation formula. So we can say that y of t is equal to beta 0 plus the summation of m is equal to 1 to m of beta 1 times the sine, or beta 1i times the sine of our fi of t plus beta 2i times the cosine of our function of t plus epsilon t. Okay, so now zone back in. So what this m is, is going to be the number of trigonometric functions we're going to use. So each time we're going to add 1 to our m, we're going to add two more of these coefficient values. So for instance, if m was equal to 2, our formula would be y to the t is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 1 times the sine of f of t plus beta 2 1 times the cosine of f of t and then plus beta 1 2 times the sine of f of t plus beta 2 2 times the cosine of f of t plus epsilon t. So the important things to take away from this whole formula in, in general. So as we add an extra trigonometric function, we're adding two more predictors. So m adds two more p. And then the second important thing is that m has to be less than or equal to our seasonal base over 2. So why is this? So say we had a seasonal base of 12, which means we're essentially predicting monthly data. So if our m is greater than 6, so say our m is equal to 7, then ultimately that would mean we have 14 predictors trying to predict 12 observations, or the values of these 12 different months, which doesn't really make sense, because you can't have more predictors than you have observations, because this would lead to perfect collinearity. So the big takeaway from this, each time we add m, we add two predictors, m cannot be greater than seasonal base over 2. And that's pretty much the big takeaway. And our fi of t is still going to be equal to 2 pi over our seasonal base. Seasonal autoregressive models. So seasonal autoregressive models are similar to autoregressive models in the sense that they use past observations in order to predict new ones. 
and they're, based, they're both based on the idea of autocorrelation. So with an autoregressive model, we would say that our y at time t is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times y to the t minus 1. So it's using the most recent observation. Now with a seasonal autoregressive model, instead it's going to take the observation that is one seasonal base away. So let's say we're working with monthly data, we would say t minus 12. So if you're trying to predict this month, and this month was January, it would take the value from last January in order to predict this January. Now if you're to say season autoregressive model with order base 2, seasonal base 12, what this means is going to take both last year's and the years before that. And seasonal base 12 means going to be, an example would be monthly data. So if you're trying to predict January for say 2021, it would take January from 2020 and January from 2019. So our formula would become y at time t is equal to beta zero plus beta one times the y value at t minus 12 plus beta 2 times y times t value at minus 24. So then at February, it would still be minus 12 minus 24 because that would be February from 12 months ago and 24 months ago. So here we're given quarterly data spanning two years. And we're asked to find quarter one and quarter two of the next year. So if we're to use a seasonal autoregressive model of order two, and then since it's quarterly data, we can say that our seasonal base is equal to 4. So we're given the coefficient estimates, so our formula would become y at time t is equal to our beta 0 plus our beta 1 times our y value at time t minus 4 plus 0.5 times our y value at t minus 8, or 2 times our seasonal base. So if we wanted to find our predicted value of quarter one for the next year, we would use our values from quarter one from the previous year, or four intervals away, and then quarter one from the year before that. So on the plot, that would just be these two points here. So if you're to plug in, it's simply gonna be one plus 0.5 times y t minus four, so 21, plus 0.5 times t minus eight, which is 20, and we get a value of 21.5 would be our prediction. And then we can do the same thing for quarter two, except now instead of using the past quarter one observations, we're gonna use the past quarter two observations. So the formula is gonna remain the same. So our y at time t is gonna be equal to one plus 0.5, and then at time t minus four is now gonna be our quarter two value or 18. And then plus 0.5 and then minus 8, which is going to be our quarter 2 value from 2 years ago, or 16. And this will produce a value of 18. We plot that. If you notice, it will follow the same kind of trend over time now. Now the main differences between a seasonal autoregressive model and an autoregressive model is the autoregressive model is going to use the nearest observations. And if we wanted to span all the way to say 12 intervals away with an autoregressive model, we would have to include all the in between terms. So t minus 1 plus beta 2 times t minus 2, all the way until beta 12 times y to t minus 12. Now, with a seasonal autoregressive model, we don't have to include these in between terms. So we can simply jump to beta 0 plus beta 1 times y to the t minus 12. And then just like autoregressive models, you locate whether you can use this model the same way, which is through autocorrelation. So you would find if you found a high autocorrelation value uh, with monthly data at um, 12 intervals away or from your 12 lagged variable, then that would be evidence to use your seasonal autoregressive model. Okay, so that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.